if you're not going to give it to me, I'll give it to myself. And I think because I have that mentality and also it stems from my family, very traditional, where women are not meant to have an education and get married. I'm very stubborn. I'm like, no, I will get that education. I will do this. With film, it's exactly the same. I deserve the lead role and I know that. I work hard, I'm talented and why can't I say that? You have moments when you're like, oh, it's not going to happen. Oh, yeah, of course you have it. You have it all the time. You're human. Especially when you've done loads of legwork to get to this point. I think it's a skill or it takes some sense of resilience to just turn down money when you know that these people can actually help you and get off the ground. I put out what cost? I want to sleep at night and that's my biggest thing. You have to be able to sleep at night and you have to look back in your life and be like, consciously, you made the right decision. And it's really the regrets actually that will stick with you. And I don't regret walking away because I knew it wouldn't be the right thing. I'm trying to change things. I work hard just for the future of women one day who don't want to have to wait another 20 years for better like Beckham. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to sit down and have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. If anybody wanted to know about your career, they would find out that you are an award-winning actress, writer, a filmmaker, and an NHS doctor in the field of psychiatry. So usually with these interviews, I like to know a little bit about how people got into what they're doing, what were the steps that they took. But I think in your case, I would really like to understand more about the process that you went through when you were making those career decisions. So can you take us back and tell us a little bit about what that process was like and what your mindset was like at the time? Yeah, I always say my story is a really, it's a strange one. So I've always wanted to do acting, like since I was three years old. That's the only thing I've ever known that I've wanted to do. Um, but I'm also a realist and I knew, look, I don't fit into Bollywood and I don't fit into Hollywood and I don't know where I fit in. I grew up on Hollywood, right? So um, they're the films that my dad took me to and that's what I was most connected with. But I knew, look, I don't look like a typical Hollywood actress for obvious reasons, which I don't even say it's obvious. Um, so I thought, okay, how am I going to make this career possible, but also financially support myself? A lot of the women in my family had arranged marriages at 18, had kids who are my age. I didn't want that for me. My parents, uh, so this is important, I say, I think so it explains why I have different career routes. And so my parents had two girls, not two boys. And in my family, it's still very hierarchical about, you know, men are more superior than women. But luckily, my parents have always been the opposite, you know, and they've always actually said, we're going to raise you as our son, as well as our daughter. So whatever a man can do, you're going to do it twice better. And so because I've had that mindset, I've always had the mindset of I can do anything I want to do, plus another career, plus something else um, and be a woman. So yeah, growing up, I was really shy and I was thinking about going to film school, you know, when you have to make these decisions at GCSEs and A-levels. I did four A-levels with sciences and drama. And I was thinking about, do I go to film school in New York? What do I do? And I, I'm really shy. Like I was really shy growing up more so. And I thought, okay, the industry is going to eat me alive. There's no roles for women of colour. The only film was Bend It Like Beckham. And still to this day, that's still the only film, which is just crazy to me. That was 20 years ago. Um, so I thought, okay, why don't I try and get a degree where I can travel the world, go in the industry and men have to listen to me as someone who's brown and a woman and take me seriously. Plus I can try and navigate it in media somehow. So I didn't really know what to do, except I wanted a powerful degree. So I did philosophy and then medicine because I thought, okay, both are so different, yet the similarities um, and both I can travel the world with and have a job with, etc. And then... I got the medical degree intending to sort of do media medicine, not actually practicing as a clinician, but then I got swept up in the NHS world as you do naively as well for me. And then I ended up finding a complete different passion, which I never ever thought I would, which was psychiatry and mental health. And I fell into that really very early on in the first like two years of being a doctor. And I love it. Like I love mental health. I love psychiatry. I love, you know, everything that comes with it. And I thought, okay, I want to explore this as well. So carried on being a doctor, kind of put my passion of acting aside because also the industry still hadn't changed. And I think it's really disheartening. So when you're still like a young woman, you know, nothing had changed. So then I was like, okay, nothing's changed, but let me try and understand how this industry works. So after work, after my NHS shift work, I went to acting school 
Um, and then I kind of realized kind of a lot of stuff like what's an agent, what's, you know, what as an actor, what do you do? What does the director do? All the lingo, et cetera. Came out of acting school. I was like, right, the industry hasn't changed. I'm going to change it. And I'm a writer. I'm a doctor. I can do this. And for me, I think very simply, being a filmmaker or theatre maker is exactly the same as being a doctor. You're, you're a producer and a director at work. And I thought, okay, let me just write a script. I'll make it all female led. It's about the NHS, it's dark comedy and mental health. And I'll put it on the stage. So I did that end of 2019. I was like, okay, so I've just got my first director credit, first producer credit, first like, you know, theatre writing credit. This isn't that bad. Um, I can do this. What stage were you at in your medical career when you were doing? So registrar, registrar. So I've been a doctor for over 10 years. So I was about... Oh, I must have been a doctor for about seven and a half, eight years around that time. And then 2020 hit, obviously COVID hit, so theatre was down. So I was like, let me move on to screen because obviously I'm a medic. I can be a COVID supervisor and a medic on set. Like, that makes sense. Um, And I think so simply. So then before the first lockdown, I just wrote in 10 minutes a comedy, you know, rom-com about COVID. Two people fall in love. They get COVID symptoms, have two weeks to isolate together and fall in love. Like, it was really simple and really fun and silly. Just got a bunch of friends together. And then that was my first, you know, screen credit, basically. And then I was like, okay, I've done both. Let's continue this. And then I moved on to my next short film, got bored, then got commissioned to two features. And then up my game last year. And then had like 22 women on set. And then the rest is history, to be honest. Like, So even though throughout your medical profession, you were doing like acting after work and acting school, you kind of really kicked things off quite recently in 2019. Yeah. And so when you think about that kind of progression, such short space time, bearing in mind that we had lockdown in that time and we had a whole pandemic, how does that feel? I feel like my progression's slow um, for two reasons. One, because I've wanted this since I was three years old. And for me, it's been a lifelong journey. I feel even though I've only actively been recognized the last few years, it feels like this has been a lifelong thing because I've done six years at med school. You know, it's not been easy. I've done 36 hour shifts and then go to acting class after. So for me... It feels like a lifelong thing. The other thing is, as a doctor, I like to work quickly. Like I write a script in a weekend or on the way home. Like I get frustrated how slow the industry is on my pace. So for me, I feel like I should be 10 steps more. And that's just because I'm a doctor, because you have to work quickly. Um, But I see from other people's perspective, they think, okay, it's a short amount of space. But I think on my side, it doesn't feel like that at all. And when you made a short film, I'm guessing there was a, quite a lot of learning there in terms of how to operate cameras or, or did you get people to do that for you? Yeah, I mean, I think every film's different. So um, I don't like to be the camera woman. Um, yeah. I like to, if I'm going to have to work on the camera, I like to be the director. And for me, I'm not that technical. Like I'm not a tech whiz. So that for me doesn't make sense. So I've always got someone else to do that. When it's my own script, I do like to either be the director or producer because I feel like no one will honor your work as much as yourself. So whenever it's my own work, I have to be part of the crew. And like literally in 2021, I made like 10 micro short films, you know, in a space of a few weeks. So I know I can do it. So, but I always like to bring other people on and see what their kind of skill set is. And I think every project's different. And I think someone else has something to offer as well. So For me particularly, I always love to bring students on because I think they're the generation that's going to take over Hollywood one day. So I love to bring film students on. And also, like when they finish their degree, then they've got they've got like 10 credits to the name. I think that's amazing. Some have director credits like I've given students a director credit on my films. um, And I wish I had someone that did that for me. So for me, I don't want the same struggle for other people that I've been having. And I'm sure I'll continue to have. But I think I always say if you want to see the change, you've got to do it yourself. Um, and don't expect anyone else to do it. So I know what I'm trying to change things for me and other women and other people of colour. And that's another thing. Majority of my films have an all cast of colour, you know, whether you're Asian or black. Like I make a point of that. Um, and I've really tried behind the camera. Like I've had over 80 percent people of colour on my sets or if you have disability or mental health, that's really important. But also I feel like you have a responsibility as a filmmaker. You've also got to do the same for other people. So you've also got to open that door for others i definitely want to touch on that especially when we talk about your film core but before we do listening to you about how you balance both of these professions anyone can see there's just quite a lot of thought that goes into how to work on both those fields anyone will know that being a doctor is quite time consuming especially early in your career but when it comes to film as well or acting you have to be available at short notice you have to block out time for production schedules so how were you able to balance that um 
really good question i get asked this question a lot i don't know i just do the same i just think as a doctor like it, it happens at work like they might say a patient's just crashed you got to drop everything and do it so with film every weekend i have it will be dedicated to film my evenings will be dedicated to it you know and if i need to use my annual leave for it i'll do that you know i think because i'm quite senior i'm almost a consultant i think also i'm so used to being a doctor now it's become bread and butter like it's not as stressful I mean it's always stressful but it's not as anxiety provoking so I'm able to juggle my time really well now I think it's just I'm really organized and I'm very truthful and transparent about it you know I'm very selective also what I put my name to one because I am a doctor and that credit means a lot to me I have a lot of people that want me to come on to stuff to say they've got a doctor on there um that's not what I'm about so if the project's really good and I have to be part of it I will then have a discussion about using my annual leave to do that instead and then make sure my patients are safe and there's a clinic running and I, I'll juggle that safely. If the project's not worthwhile for me, I won't do that. But I always, always manage to do it if it's a project that I think has my heart in it. And on this topic of balance, I think it'd be really good to touch on the headspace because when you've got these two consuming career paths, and especially for anybody out there, if they're working nine to five and setting up a side hustle or they're balancing a very intense career and quite an active home life, having that headspace to be able to do both is a skill in itself. Is that anything that you have to develop? I naturally balance myself quite well. And I think that's really down to my mum. So when I was growing up, uh, there's a huge gap between me and my sister. So I was almost like an only child. My mum... And I'm really grateful she did this. So after school, I would go, I was like chess club, fencing club, rowing team, you name it, I did it. Um, the weekends, I would be doing homework in between. I went to dance school. I did ballet, tap modern on the weekends till I was 22. And in between the classes, I would do all my homework and all my revision. So I think I've naturally been built in a way. It's like brushing my teeth. Like for me, I juggle as naturally as I would eating food. So for me, I don't double second guess it. And that's because I know how I work and I'm dyslexic and I think because I, I was diagnosed at eight years old I know how I work and I know what I need to do and it's become a second nature to me and I think for anyone that is trying to balance it I think you need to look at how do you best work and what works for you so for me for example what I do and that is how I run I meal prep the whole week like I've always done that I have all my clothes like I'm like I'm like in the military like that's how I function I've also been trained like that as a doctor so literally I get up I go like almost like putting the scrubs on I have all my clothes laid out. I put on the same outfit every single day and you will literally see me in the same outfit. Like underneath, I'm just wearing the same black. I have like the same black tops and the same black trousers. I don't like to double think. And I think really, I'm not saying I'm successful, but really successful people do that. You know, they wake up early. They have the same uniform. It's almost like a school uniform. They, put, they wear that every day. And I don't want to have to think about what I'm eating. Like it's, it sounds really simple, but I literally am so busy. I can just grab the food out the fridge. I'm done. And I go and I my routine is really important to me. So I have the same morning routine and evening routine. And I think you have to find if that works for you and whatever it is, um, because both careers are so all over the place. Like you said, sometimes I have to drop stuff and go. But I think if you can manage stuff that doesn't give you a headache and anxiety, do it you know, make your life easier for you. It's like, you know, when people on Sundays, they typically do their laundry and deep clean the house. Yeah. Do that for yourself. Do that for your mental health and physical health. Make it a routine that you don't even think about it. So in the morning you get up and I do my gratitude. I do my meditation and prayers like bang. It's like I don't double think about it. It's like showering. So you need to find something for you that helps your mental health and well-being because this industry and whatever you're doing, you don't want your health impacted. So I think look at what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are and work what your strengths are. So I can't work like other people work. I can't just go out for lunch or go out for this and that unless it's a day off. Um, so I know if I don't have my military like set up at home, I feel anxious. So for me, that works. And I think that's why I'm able to do so much for me. But I know how I work, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, that does, especially if you've done it from an early, early stage, because some of the thoughts that came to my mind were things like burnout, you know, how long is it sustaining for? But it sounds to me like you've been kind of doing this for a while yeah and honestly you speak to my close friends I'm the laziest person like honestly it doesn't look I think on the outside it looks like I'm doing a lot but I I have a nap every single day for two hours like I make time for me I binge watch Netflix like for three hours a day like um but I know how I work and that's what I'm saying so I think never judge anyone what you think like um I'm incredibly lazy um and I will take a month off go on a holiday like I you know I balance 
me time and my family's time first over work. So Paul is a short film that you have produced and also starred in along with Nawadia and Stephen Opwal. The story is essentially about a young South Asian woman coming to the realization of who she is. And you touch on topics like religious and cultural identity from a female perspective. Let's start off understanding a bit about why that subject matter was important to you. So a couple of years ago when I was in acting school, I was watching something and I think it was some Marvel film. And I saw in the background, you know, as you do, like an extra brown person. And it's always a man in a turban. Like you'll always see it in some big films, like a war film as well. Like you'll just see them in the background. And suddenly it occurred to me, I was like, hang on. Why do we still not have brown lead roles? Like, why? Why is that? Like, why does it? Why is that always happening? And also, my dad wears a turban. Half my family do. I don't double look at him when he's wearing it. But why do we not have lead roles in superhero films, war films, whatever, in a turban and a woman? So I was like, suddenly, then core came into my head, like the entire poster and the feature film. And I thought, right, like it perfectly formed in my head. And that's how film ideas sometimes come to me. And I thought, this has got to go to Hollywood. I'm going to get it there. But this is not the time and place at the moment. I need to get a good team behind me. We used to do a lot of research and get the community involved. And I was very aware of that responsibility. And then last year came and I was collaborating uh, with my friend Jackie Sohal. And we were like, let's make our last short film before we move on to solely features and TV series. What should we make? And then Call came in the conversation and we were like, before we tackle the feature of it, because we, we are intending to take this to Oscars and BAFTA, like we are, we're not hiding behind that. Like that's where we want to take it. Let's do a test run with a short film and let's see how that works. And um, so we wrote it, produced it, I starred in it. It was really to give a voice to us as women of colour, but especially the Asian community. So we wanted to make a difference with Cora as well, to make a statement in Hollywood. So we had 75 brown women attached to the film, which I'm so proud about. Specifically with the turban, it's a huge taboo subject. Like, I know how hard it is to wear a turban. It comes with a lot of pride and honour. But there's a lot of racism attached to it and discrimination and some people still don't understand what it means. Even in my own community, especially when a woman wears it, you are discriminated more so much more than a man. So we really wanted to tackle lots of layers. One, in Hollywood, we wanted to make a difference and have our voices out there um, and collaborate with the community. And um, that's what we did. We had Harpreet Kaur from The Apprentice. We had like athletes part of the film. Um, So we really wanted it to be inclusive as well as diverse. And then also in the community, we really wanted to showcase women and our voices because we are still in ethnic communities, still we're not given that platform to speak out. And I really want to tackle the taboo of women who want to embrace who they are in that culture. I want to ask you about the story behind the story about how the film came to be. Can you shed light a little bit more on to how you sort of got your team together, how you also got the actors together as well? Yeah, so... Um, Right, so the idea came about three years ago, fully formed in my head. So I had the script already in my head. So that that was easy, I suppose. I never make anything unless I have the funding attached to it um, because I just think, you know, you shouldn't have to pay to make films when, you know, there are people that would love to collaborate with you. So the last year when Juggy and I kind of decided we we're going to make it, we obviously, we got, because dist- obviously it's not just my film then, it's his film as well. So we had to honour that also his voice needs to come in. So then we wrote the short version of it and um, we did like 12 drafts of it, which for me is like a lot. Like I don't do more than like two drafts on anything. Um, So we had to make sure both his voice was in it as a man and my voice was in it as well. Um, So then we did that and then it was about funding. So we kind of split delegation of jobs. So I said to him, you go look at the casting. I'm going to look at the funding and get two brains. So we just speed this up because we wanted to make it that year end of that year because we'd like to move quickly. We had a couple of people that were interested, but I turned them down because they wanted to take control of the film. And for me, it's very important to have creative license of my work rather than handing something over that's very important to me we found a company that really understood what we were about and really believed in the project and we thought we can work with you closely so that so that got sorted by like a few months later i don't know so we wrote the film april 2021 we got the funding kind of conversation going and then it was kind of like find contracts by the end of that year but the money hadn't come through until 2022 so and then in that process It was really hard to find actors, if I'm honest, because there's not many South Asian actors, one, but two, know what they're doing, right? Um, And have credits to the name because we wanted to make sure because this film was so important to us, we had the right actors with experience. Like 
this wasn't a training film this was like an actual film so that was really hard um and also to keep in mind covid you know not many people are here you know well-known actors who are south asian or in india um so it was really difficult so we needed actors who lived in britain um or la that we could fly over easily during a pandemic um also there's not many people so it took a long time actually with the casting it took months and then we locked people in can you imagine and then got the money at the exact same time and then we were like we must move quick because also the actors i think one thing to keep in mind not everyone can work every day so we only had two dates we could film and that was like bonkers because then also during that time we were also casting for crew so it was really important we got a different director we didn't want to direct this even though we direct and we wanted just a really diverse crew and a crew that we've never worked with before we've always had friends on who have helped out or friends to give credits to but we wanted people in the industry that are working professionals BAFTA crew as well so at the same time we were interviewing for directors DOPs, lighting, sound, you name it, we were going through all of that at the same time, plus trying to get, you know, the camera equipment, the insurance, the locations. It was mad. And then when we got everyone together, we had to get everyone's schedule. Can you imagine? 75 people's schedule, all locked in. And then we came up with two dates that we could definitely do. And that was because Nina could only do two dates as well. So we were like, oh, um, luckily we got a date in and it was during a bank holiday weekend in april so this is only two months after and that goes so quickly and then the maddest thing is a week before this always happens in film we had to find a brand new location for two of the locations and we had a week and it was a bank holiday so we only had like four days on top of rehearsals on top of costume fittings on cost on top of everything else um, so it was just, I don't even, that whole week was a blur. A tough one because you've got all the permits and everything that comes with that, depending yeah. on like filming. And you only had like a few days to do it. And I think people forget we're also working full time in another career. Plus people are doing other work. Like yeah. everyone's not just solely on our film. Like everyone has other jobs as well. Yeah. And, um, and then Nina, it was just like, she almost didn't get to the film set because she was shooting abroad and came in the night before and there was a huge like rain storm or something it was just like there's loads of things that people aren't you're not aware of behind the scenes but it was yeah. just full on so it really did feel like you were part of a huge feature film set the way we did the short film because there was so many moving parts yeah and then shot the film and then i can't even remember it was such a blur um and on top of which we had bbc coming on set so we were also trying to sort all of that out plus you know all the risk assessments and everything and making sure sets were clean so after every film set juggy and i would stay and i we'd just clean everything for covid as well make sure everything was safe for everyone you touched on film finance a little bit earlier i think this is an area for a lot of filmmakers that they really struggle to finance their films and it was great that you got somebody on board it sounds like as well you managed to get them on board before you even had the cast which i know people don't want to part with their money unless they know they've got big names attached to it or established writers and established directors can you just share with us a little bit and add some tips as well on what was that film financing process like so with call particularly what you're asking about i just emailed all my private investors that have funded you know my execs that have funded my previous work um and some it wasn't the right fit some you know they weren't able to take on any more productions, whatever. So I hit a new dead end and like that's never happened to me before. I've always like had someone I know that's funded it, an exec. So I was like, okay. So with Core, I emailed, I can't remember, I must have emailed over a hundred people. I emailed like a hundred companies, right? Um, and there's no easy way. I don't know if there is an easy way, if there is amazing. Um, but I I just did the grit. I just emailed every company and just said, I'm Parvinda. This is the work I've done before. Core is this film. I think it's really different and unique and it's female led. You know, would you like to have a chat? And I think only a handful replied. Um, so I don't I don't know if there's an easy answer. I think you have to email everyone and anyone yeah. and anyone you think might particularly take an interest in it. So for, for example, if you're making a film about ADHD, go and email ADHD companies, go and email these organizations. That's what I would say. So it depends what your film's about. With this particular film, I couldn't I couldn't go and email like religious companies. I think that would have been quite disrespectful because the whole point of this film is not actually about the religion. It's about giving opportunity. So I didn't want us to be kind of put in a box that this is just a religious film because it's not actually at the yeah. core root of it, um, pun intended. So I just emailed loads of companies. And for me, I looked at female-led companies because 
that's what I'm interested in. I want women on my set. I just would be careful who you sign with because I did have two people that wanted to take call from America. Um, but as I said, they want to take full control of it and that's not okay with me. Some people, that's fine. Like if you just want to sell a script and you don't mind, then for sure, go for it. But I don't I don't want that. And then when I did find the company for me, we had a lot of Zooms, like also because we've never worked together. I want to make sure I'm bringing on the right people. They obviously don't know my work, but from the very first Zoom, they just got me. They understood exactly what I stood for. And I think sometimes it was with that particular situation, it was on good faith. And sometimes you do just need to jump in and see if it works out. And it did work out. And I tend to go with my gut. Think for funding advice, I would email everyone that you think would be interested. And then I would just email every production company and see what comes to you. Someone will reply. Like, you know, you do the math, someone will reply. And then I would go with your gut. I think that's really important. Don't ever sell yourself short because someone will want to take your film if it's good enough. Sounds like you've got some great ambitions for core. Are you able to share any of that with us? Um, what I can share is it's now being made into a feature. We've got the script um, and we're having conversations with production companies and producers. It's, we're very clear with Core, cool, this has to go to Hollywood. So everyone that comes onto it are people that we've not worked with before. And they're kind of the big dogs. So we're having those conversations now. Nina is attached to it. We're trying to plan when to go for casting um, and we're trying to look at that now. We've had ITV cover it. We've had over 30 BBC interviews concerning it. So there is a need for this film. What I do want to ask you about your mindset when it comes to going for things that you want. Throughout this whole conversation and when we also chatted before, that's one thing that I've just really seen consistently. You really just set your mind to something and you go for it. Even even this path you've taken, some might even say it's sort of deviated from what would be like a, a social norm path, like sticking to one career. But you just mm. no, I can be a doctor and I could be a filmmaker and I can, mm. I can be a feature filmmaker if I want. So mm. Is there anything that you can share with us about that mindset? I developed it from a very young age and it goes back to in my family, men are still seen as superior, right? So from a very young age, when I was a little girl, I was always told you're not going to achieve that. And I'm not saying everyone in the family, I'm saying some people. I'm dyslexic. I was told I was stupid. I'm not going to finish school. Like I had a lot of bullying growing up. Um, And I think through that, I found my strength because you have to survive. And my my mum's been amazing about that. She was like, of course you can do it. Of course you can do it. Like if they could do it, why can't you do it? And do and wear it wearing heels. Like, why not? I was like, yeah, mum, of course, yeah, I can do it. And I think it is because I've been bullied so much where they make you feel so tiny that actually you get to a point of, well, I'm just gonna go for it because you're gonna say I'm rubbish and stupid anyway. So I'm just gonna go for it because you're gonna say something anyway. Like, do you know what I mean? If I accomplish it or not. So I think because I have that mindset, when I put my mind to things, I do get it. And that and that also comes from being a doctor because if I want something for my patient, I will get it because I want the best for them. And that's how we're trained, okay? So it's also my training. So with film, it's exactly the same. I deserve the lead role and I know that. I work hard, I'm talented, and why can't I say that? So I think if you're not gonna give it to me, I'll give it to myself. And I think because I have that mentality and also it stems from my family, very traditional, where women are not meant to have an education and get married. I'm very stubborn. I'm like, no, I will get that education. I will do this. And also like, why can't you have multiple careers? I don't know where that conversation came in. You like more than one music, right? You like more than one band. So why can't you have lots of things? And I don't understand why that's seen as like a shocking thing. I'm trying to change things. So I don't want my daughter one day having to work this hard the way I'm working. Like I've been awake for 36 hours sometimes doing a 24 hour shift, you know, covering A&E and then going to a film set. Like I work hard just for the future of, you know, not just me, but for women one day who don't want to have to wait another 20 years for better like Beckham. So you've got to give yourself the mentality for it. Um, And mine came from a very young age. Something I like to talk about on this podcast is about being honest about some of the things that we didn't know and that have really helped us along the way. You can choose at what point, whether this is at the start of your career, start one of your films, or even at the start of call, but what is something or what are the things that you really, really didn't know you found has really helped you that you do know now? No one's gonna give it to you. And I think that's really important to know. I really thought I was that naive at 18 that someone's literally gonna knock at my door and say, we wanna put you on our film. No one's gonna come and do that for you, okay? Unless you, your dad is like, a huge 
Hollywood, whatever. Um, so that was a really big learning lesson I had a couple of years ago. Like I said, when I started writing my theatre piece, because I realised no one is going to help me. And I'm not saying boohoo, like, mm, I'm just saying that's the frank frankness of it. So go do it yourself. So I think that's that's something you really need to process. So no one's going to give you a deal. No one's going to, you know, say you're the next hot thing. No one's going to say your script is incredible. No one's going to whatever, whatever, whatever. I think that's a really important lesson to learn early on um, because you can start spreading the seeds and start doing the groundwork yourself. And I think the second thing that's really important, I've mentioned it already, but it is really important. You must go with your instincts. I've been in a lot of situations in this industry and that's a whole different conversation. Um, go with your gut because your gut does not lie. And because this industry does not have standards and regulations like any other corporate job, in, in example, there's a lot of productions without risk assessments, HR, safeguarding, well-being, et cetera, et cetera. No one's going to protect you. So you need to go with your gut. So if you're feeling something, your body's reacting to something before your brain realizes it. Um, and you shouldn't be in that room. And I mean that in whole different le levels. I'm not just saying the obvious, but... Um, and that goes with who you bring on your own set. So who you work with. You know, I've tried to make stuff with some from some who I thought were friends and there's been really bad energy and um, not everyone has your best intention. So I think just be wary of people, you know, trust yourself a lot. And it's OK to say no. Like I walked away from the funders for call with no money thinking, oh, will this happen? But I knew the right person will come. Do go with your gut and instinct. Don't sell yourself short. I've walked away from big projects you know, big platforms because it's not been morally, ethically, instinctively something I would go for and I wouldn't want to sell myself like that. Remember who you are, you know, remember what your ethics were, how your parents raised you and what you wanted to do when you came to this industry and don't let go of that. In those situations where you listened to your gut, for example, to the previous funding, did you also then know in your gut that it was still going to work out? Yeah. You have moments when you're like, oh, it's not going to happen. Oh, yeah, of course you have it. You have it all the time. You're human. Especially when you've done loads of legwork to get to this point. I think it's a skill or it takes some sense of resilience to just turn down money when you know that these people can actually help you and get this off the ground. I put out what cost I want to sleep at night and that's my biggest thing you have to be able to sleep at night and you have to look back in your life and be like consciously you made the right decision and it's really the regrets actually that will stick with you and I don't regret walking away because I knew it wouldn't be the right thing okay can you get a little bit vulnerable with us and tell us something that you are not so aware of at the moment that you're working on loads of things like I don't know where my career is going I don't know like am I going to be with the NHS you know uh, for another year am I gonna will anyone hire me will I always have to make my own stuff you know I don't know like um and I think part of the creative industry is and I'm still getting used to it I'm not there yet but you have to kind of get comfortable with the unknown um like the NHS I'm very clear of like I go do this I'm a registrar I go do that I'm a consultant I go do that I'm you know what I mean there's definitely a very clear path and not not just with the yeah. but with a lot of careers even when you work yeah. in the corporate world you know that okay what are the positions that are going to be above you that you're going, going to be going for in the filmmaking world it's not it's not like that at all it is such a strange industry because you really don't know what's going to happen um good or bad you know in between especially for someone like me because i'm very military that's terrifying like it, it frightens me it's like will i have a job you know if i left the nhs will i get hired freelancing terrifies me i'll be honest about it um i need to know where i'm going i need a path so i think for me yeah it's just the unknown but it's also you got to jump in and just kind of swim with this unease and just see what happens but look after yourself at the same time thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your thoughts and perspectives there's so much that people are going to get out of this interview so i really appreciate your time so i know just not even from this interview but from our chat support like how busy you are for anybody watching and they want Want to know more about core and more about you what are your socials i'm dr pavinda shergal <laughs> i'm on twitter and social um instagram that's just social media that is social media uh core is just on the instagram page um at core underscore film and we have all our um updates on there and we actually have something very exciting happening tomorrow so okay. i'm sure this will come out after that but i'm sure you'll see when it comes out yeah okay well i'll be definitely watching that space thank you thank you too bye bye, bye.